in the simplest terms, you could say that mastering is like the bridge between the consumer ear and what happens in the, in the, in the studio. Okay. The studio these days is, is defined by the place where the creativity is done, and that studio could be somebody's laptop, or it could be a full-blown recording studio with recording rooms, mixing rooms, and everything. Okay. So it's the point in between both of those things. And what the mastering, you know, there's so many functions of what goes on during the process. But essentially, the, the mastering is kind of a combination of a judging, uh, like a, a qualifying and an, an improving of, 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 the, of, the, of the sonics. And, and that is done either by the mastering engineer by himself. People send files to me. I listen to them. I evaluate them for the, the, the type of impact that they have, the kind of balance they have. And then I run it through my processing and give it back to the client as a mastered file. And then they would compare the two of those things. Um, hopefully what, what my ear is imagining that could be, it becomes in, in the ears of the person who created it. So in other words, they, they thought, they give it to me, they've mixed the album or they've mixed the song and they think it's the best that they can make it. Then they give it to me, I give it back to them and they discover that it actually could sound better. Got it. And it's, right. not, it's one of the reasons why people come to, to Sterling will pay a, a, a extra money to work with our exper more experienced people with some great equipment. And, um, and it's a revelation when we, uh, when we work with the, the different wires and, and, try to get the, and try to show them what the difference is between um, the, uh, the signal path we create and the signal path they created in the mix. Uh, their ears really pick up. And they, 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 well, at, at that point, they, they, they start to also trust that they're in the right spot. Okay. The 2009 albums were English sequence. They were not the right. American albums that we knew. Right. In the American albums, there are, I think, 28 versions, 28 different songs which were different versions. Okay. But the directive was, this has already been approved by the, by the board, okay. and we don't want to change it. But if you can enhance it in some way without changing it, which is why the Wireworld cable was so perfect for me to use in this project, because the... the the, how can I describe it? The, if you're trying to have no coloration and just a, a pure signal, as much right. pure signal and as much pure dynamic as you can, with all the cable that I have in-house, the, the, new, the, the newest version of the, of the Wireworld cable, was it, sa it saved me because it didn't introduce something into the signal path that would immediately put me at a disadvantage as to, as to, as to changing too much. Now, that Yeah, it's, I think it's at least 10 years, and it was the, it was the original, uh, you know, again, I don't know the brand names as well as I should, but it was the original thick gold cable, which replaced the Mogami cable that we were using as for, for interconnect. And, uh, you know, people would occasionally bring up another brand of cable uh, saying that was really great, and I, would, I kept comparing these different cables, a Cardis cable or, you know, I mean, they would always bring it up, and I would, and, and I would have more and more respect for my Wireworld cable every time because it was like, wow, that's not even close to the Wireworld cable. I mean, I was like so impressed with, the, with the, the fullness and the presence and the clarity of the Wireworld cable. And David had recently approached me and, and had some new products, and it was, I was totally blown away. Great. The signal path, you know, I mean, I, I, I kind of learned this years ago uh, from listening to records that Doug Sachs was making in the 1970s. I would, I would, because I, I was mastering at that point, and I, and I you know, I had like a, a Scully tape machine and a, a Neumann rack, and I didn't really wasn't sophisticated enough to know about how to how to work around my signal path. It was just a given. It was like a, a plug in in a box. You know, you, pl right. you plug the machine in and you do it right. And then I would hear these records from the mastering lab and just go like, oh my God, these sound unbelievable. What is this sound? And it was because of the, because of the electronics, because they worked on the different stages of electronics. And in those years, I didn't have, at Sterling, we didn't have um, that type of shop that we have here now that could create things and make new things. Right. And uh, I just learned to respect the gear and, and, and the signal path. But uh, that's why when we, came, when we came to this room, uh, you know, I ended up... Um, you know, with with the uh, with the tech shop, we ended up building a patch bay, and um, now I'm able to really use the patch bay and the signal path creatively, and use the wires. The wires make all the difference in the there world. Are, there so are two uh, wire world uh, cables that I use interchangeably. Okay. Uh, to create to get in the direction of where I want to go before I start to equalize and, and, and compress. 
Okay. And they, they have a little bit of a different uh, sonic color. Got it. And uh, sometimes I want the more the, the completely neutral one, which which just you know has the great dynamics. But sometimes things need they sometimes they need a color. Sometimes they're sometimes they're too clean. Sometimes you hear things too too clearly, but it, where it becomes unmusical. It's like 192 recording. You know, if you get if you do if uh, somebody records something at 192, it's like high definition television. Like you, you see the makeup line on the side right, of it, you right. see too much. You don't need that kind of clarity sometimes. Right. So you have to determine again, project by project, uh, day by day. So you know, what happens with um, with uh, I wouldn't say many producers and engineers, but a, a good number of the really talented ones is that they really want you to 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 create a digital file which sounds really exactly like their mix. In other words, they don't want any loss. Right. And I get clients who have tried mastering with people and they always, you know, they, but the reason they, they come to me is that they feel that I'll be able to capture their mix without changing it. So sometimes my job is to change it and to, and to but sometimes my job is not, really not, like not to screw it up. Right. Okay. So the, 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 the Platinum Eclipse cable has been a fantastic tool in that because it's so transparent and so open and clear and accurate that I can, I can go through some of my analog gear without putting a color on it. And when they get something back, they basically recognize it as what they had. Got it. Plus, it's at the level that a CD has to be. Uh, it's edited, the things are edited together, the things about mastering that we talked about earlier. Right, right. But, and again, this was the point of the Beatles uh, using the, the, uh, the Platinum Eclipse cable in the Beatles project, because I really did not want to introduce another color. I really wanted it to be as close to that digital file as I possibly could. But when I when I show people in the room in a session, it's like you pulled a rabbit out of a hat. Like they just they don't understand how it, it could make such a difference, you know.